Ezekiel saw the wheel. People know what that song is about. If you go in the Hebrew Bible to the very first chapter of the book of Ezekiel, you will read about the prophet's full-blown, dramatic, mystical experience. It is one of the most dramatic, mystical experiences in the entirety of the Bible. It rivals anything you'd find in the book of Revelation. And what people focus on, or what some people focus on, is the fact that Ezekiel seems to talk about several floating metal disks, a wheel within a wheel that fly about in the air and seem to defy the laws of gravity. Some people go so far to say that Ezekiel's vision is a documentation of UFOs, flying saucers in the Bible. I'm not saying that this morning. I'm not not saying that. <laughs> so what does it what does it mean? I am more interested, rather than trying to explain what I Ezekiel, not a seagull, Ezekiel may or may not have seen. I'm more interested in the fact that this that this story, this powerful story, has been passed on and that, you know, uh, some years ago in the African-American church uh, hymn hymnody tradition, this story is received and held to be a story of, that, of faith, of strength, of dignity, of liberation. And so perhaps different stories, different impossible stories might inspire. I want to tell you a couple of impossible stories. One happened in June of 1858 when a young Mark Twain and his brother Henry were working on a riverboat on the Mississippi River. While lying in port in St. Louis, Mark Twain had a dream. He writes, In the dream I had seen my brother Henry as a corpse. He lay in a metallic burial case. He was dressed in a suit of my clothing, and on his breast lay a great bouquet of flowers, mainly white roses, with a red rose in the center. The dream was so vivid that upon waking up, Twain got dressed and set out for the funeral before realizing that it had been a dream. Several weeks later, his brother Henry was severely burned in a steam engine explosion and died from complications of the treatment he received for his injuries. Mark Twain attended his brother's funeral. He writes, when I entered the dead room, I was shocked to see that my dream from a few weeks earlier had become reality. Instead of the customary pine box, a group of women who had heard about the accident had raised $60 for a metal casket. My brother was indeed wearing one of my suits, which he had borrowed from me without telling me. All of the details from my dream were the same, except one. But just then, an elderly woman entered and placed a bouquet of white roses with one red rose in the center on my brother's chest. <laughs> Who knows what really happened? But we do know that Twain would continue to be haunted and inspired by this dream for the rest of his life. Twenty years later, in 1878, he wrote an essay about these sorts of experiences, but refused to publish it out of fear that uh, the public would not take it seriously. And another 20 years passed, 40 years later, until Twain published a pair of essays on these sorts of experiences in Harper's Weekly, under the title, Mental Telegraphy. 
Here's another impossible story about a man named Hans Berger. Hans Berger was a young student in Germany studying math and astronomy when he took a break from his studies to join the military. This was in 1892, when during a field exercise, he was tossed from his horse and fell in the path of a carriage pulling a heavy artillery cannon. The carriage halted inches away from him. Berger should have been crushed, but escaped narrowly with his life intact. At that very moment, Berger's sister, many, many miles away, was overcome with an emotion of dread and fear, fearing that something awful had befallen her brother, insisted that their father send a telegram to Hans, in which she expressed her concern and asked whether he was all right. We don't know what really happened, but we do know that this experience shook Hans and changed the trajectory of his life. He returned to school, switched his studies from math and physics to psychiatry, and set out on his lifelong goal of trying to understand the workings of the brain. 30 years later, in 1924, he became the inventor of a machine called the electroencephalograph, the EEG which measures electrical impulses in the brain. So if you've ever had an EEG, who's had an EEG? A fun piece of trivia is that this machine was invented by Hans Berger in an attempt to discover a scientific basis for psychic telepathy, which didn't find any evidence of that, but the machine remains. There's all sorts of questions we could ask about these two impossible stories. What actually happened? But another and perhaps more interesting question is what meaning we should make out of them. For Twain and for Berger, they seemed to mean an awful lot. Decades and decades later, these experiences continued to fascinate, motivate, and inspire them. The Twain story and the Berger story are just two stories that Preifold writes about. They are two stories out of thousands, tens of thousands of such stories. And by the way, the Twain story and the Berger story are not even close to being the wildest and the weirdest of the stories. I'll let you go read it if you want more about those. I want to make some observations about these phenomena that Kreipel writes about. First of all, these phenomena are experienced by people of all walks of life, all cultures, all ethnicities, all socioeconomic levels, all education levels. They happen to people of diverse religious backgrounds and to people of no religious background. How people make meaning out of them is greatly shaped by culture. Kripal seems to pay special attention to academics who have these sorts of experiences, perhaps because he himself is an academic and more importantly, because Kripal wants to welcome inquiry into these impossible things. And so he writes, his books are chock full of the impossible experiences of biologists, neuroscientists, physicists, Nobel Prize winning scientists. He talks also about how many academics or people in general Avoid talking about these experiences out of a fear of not being taken seriously or, in fact, out of a fear of being shunned. Popular author and Reed College graduate, Barbara Ehrenreich, who holds a PhD in chemistry and who identifies as an atheist, a rationalist, a skeptic, and a mythbuster, wrote a memoir in her 70s about the mystical experience she had experienced as a teenager, 60 years earlier. She captured well this reluctance to speaking about or writing about these sorts of experiences. In fact, she claims that that experience that she had when she was 13 or 14 actually animated her entire kind of life journey set before her, kind of the, the life that she lived and yet she kept it completely secret for 
more than half a century. Ehrenreich writes, what do you do with something like this? An experience so anomalous, so disconnected from the normal life you share with other people that you can't even figure out how to talk about it. I was also, I admit, afraid of sounding crazy. Trying to insert an account of a mystical experience into a conversation and you'll likely get the same response as you would if you confided that you had been a victim of alien abduction. <laughs> Which I would add. Or try confiding in others that you've been the victim of alien abduction and see where that gets you. Ezekiel saw the wheel. In my experience as a minister, I have encountered people you, all over the spectrum of religious experience. I've encountered parishioners, numerous parishioners through the years, including members of this congregation, who have told me about having had profound, powerful, and deeply meaningful mystical experiences. A few people told me about them as they were leaving after the first service this morning. At the same time, I've also met people who've never had such an experience and would prefer to keep it that way. <laughs> and I've met people who've never had a mystical experience, but experienced some sort of deep longing inside, feeling like there is some experience that they are missing out on. One of the interesting lessons that I take away from Jeffrey Kripal's writings is that mystical experiences seem not to be, there seems to be no real clear formula that for producing them, except that they're often related to and seem to happen concurrent with the experience of extreme trauma. They're ex connected with trauma, grief, and loss. Just two extreme examples. Neurologist Jill Bolte-Taylor, she wrote a book about her mystical experience. Her mystical experience occurred when she suffered a stroke. In her book, My Stroke of Insight, she reports being conscious, and as a, as a trained neuroscientist, being aware of the things that are happening to her brain and, and what's happening in real time. But she also writes about all these truly bizarre, insights and understandings, meaningful insights and understandings that came from this experience of traumatic brain injury. Likewise, Elizabeth Crone's profound mystical experience occurred when she was struck by lightning. She was a mother with two small children who was about to attend a memorial service for a beloved aunt at her family synagogue and was struck by lightning in the parking lot. Her book, Changed in a Flash, and these titles need some work. <laughs> Details her mystical experiences as a result of this traumatic event. Have I made anybody really uncomfortable so far? Okay. As I said before, I'm not particularly interested in the veracity of these experiences, and certainly, certainly there are hucksters frauds, imposters, and charlatans who make up stuff for attention and for profit. But there are also people who report having had these sorts of experiences where it's clear that that's not the motivation. And there are people who've had these experiences who've kept them hidden for decades and decades are circumspect about their experience out of fear of being ridiculed and shunned. You may be asking yourself why I chose this topic to preach about, besides the fact that I find this stuff actually pretty interesting, and the fact that I need to come up with something to say. <laughs> I'm writing 35 sermons a year. But here is is why. Besides a conviction that I share with Professor Kreipel that these experiences are part of who we are and that, and that part of being a 
a good community, a, a Gnostic community, is being able to bring our whole selves, and that whole self does include our experiences of the impossible. But Jeffrey Kripal relates this study to an overall project, a humanistic project that he has. He tells the story of someone who, as a child, was very interested in the encyclopedia, read the encyclopedia from, from front to back. One day, this child was, was on a school field trip somewhere, and the person engaging the students posed a, a question, threw out a question to them, what is a human being worth? And the child blurts out, two dollars and 63 cents. <laughs> which is clearly not the right answer. <laughs> Except this child had read in the encyclopedia that if you reduced, if you reduced the human body to its component elements and minerals, the iron and the copper and the zinc, the magnesium and sodium and calcium and so forth, that if you broke us down into our parts and sold us, that we would be worth a whopping $2.63. Perhaps more today calculating for inflation. <laughs> Depending on supply and demand, we might be worth some more or some less. And that's clearly not the right answer. Others would determine worth by what we can sell our labor for, what we're worth is what we can produce for the economy. There's all sorts of ideologies within the world that attempt to commodify people, objectify people, reduce us to something mechanistic, advance the idea that all we are is a meat computer. There's all sorts of ideologies that deny the worth and even the humanity of certain subsets of people, whether that's based on race or religion or gender or sexuality or ability or any other and every other category that you can imagine. And I see Kripal's project as a scholar, as advancing against those sorts of claims, a radical humanism, he would call it a radical superhumanism, which is the, the human as super. And I don't think you need to agree with him or be, even be interested in what fascinates him to hold one another, to hold each other in esteem in this big-hearted way. What if we were to imagine a human being as super? Kripal imagines his project, his radical humanism, as pointing in that direction. He sees in the study of these phenomena pointing to several ideas, which I think are worthy. One of those ideas is reflexivity, the ability to move outside one, one's own world and observe it critically and compassionately from the outside. The ability to make fair and just comparisons across different ideas. A common cosmic humanism that understands the human as an expression of the entire universe. That understands the human as an expression of the entire universe. And last, he points to a deep, dark ecology understood as self-care. Which is ever needed in these times. Perhaps Taking human experience seriously leads to all of those things. Perhaps not, but I certainly hope so. Amen. And let us sing our uh, last hymn of the morning. It is, uh, tried to find a hymn about this, and since there were no hymns, about aliens, <laughs> I give you wonders still the world shall witness, number 139, and I invite you to rise in body or in spirit.